All right, so we're going to have a guest preacher tonight. We're going to have Anthony come up and preach. So uh, um, I really, I, I, it's really good when some, like some of the other men in here can preach as well as myself. Uh, not only because it gives me an opportunity to have a bit of a break, because you guys know I work a full-time job as well. So sometimes when I don't have to be preparing on the weekend, I actually get some time with my family. So I got to go bowling with them and stuff like that. But also... Um, you know, we all have a different perspective on the on familiar topics. So sometimes even though we're hearing on the same topic, we're hearing somebody else's perspective. It's another thing that they can bring to the table and encourage and exhort us here. Not only that, it, it hopefully encourage uh, the rest of you men, if you guys have, you know, the opportunity as well to preach or have the inclination to teach. Hopefully, you know, when men come up and preach, that sort of spars you to say, hey, you know what, maybe I'll you know, have something to share as well with the church too. So with that, I'll ask Anthony to come up and I'm sure you'll Give him, his, give him your undivided attention. Thanks. I'm just going to go upstairs. I want to turn that on. I'm just going to go upstairs and check the volume because we changed it a bit. But you just go ahead. Um, all right, guys, uh, to start off, I'm going to read from Mark chapter 16, 15 to 16. Um, and he said unto them, this is Jesus speaking, Go, you in, go ye into the, all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Oh, I'm just going to say a quick prayer, guys. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, I pray that you would... Um, Give me wisdom of words here tonight that I can um, uh, preach your word with clarity, um, that it would be a blessing to the brothers and sisters here tonight and also uh, edify them unto good works. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so the title of my sermon here tonight, guys, is uh, Preach the Gospel. Um, as you all know, we're entering into a new year and no doubt a few of us probably have some um, New Year's resolutions. Um, you know, maybe we, you know, we want to, uh, you know, get to church a little bit more, uh, soul winning a bit more. We want to, you know, be a bit more of a blessing to our families. Um, maybe we want to lose a few kilos, you know, five kilos maybe. I know I probably need to lose about ten. But, um, yeah, so New Year's resolutions. But I guess what I wanted to focus on here tonight was um, a command that our Lord gave us. And uh, we know it as soul winning, uh, but I guess in the Bible it says preach the gospel. Um, so in my sermon tonight, guys, I'm going to uh, you know, touch on exactly what is the gospel very briefly, um, then go over uh, a few points that I like to use to help me to sort of stay focused when I'm out preaching the gospel. There's been times where I've been a little bit off track, so I've sort of come up with five points to help me stay uh you know, focused and, and in step with, with preaching the, the word and the gospel and hopefully getting people saved. Um, and then also at the end, I'm going to sort of drive in a few points why I think it's important that we should preach the gospel. Um, so firstly, I'm going to, you know, uh, define what the gospel actually is. And I guess here in Mark 16, 15 to, to 16, it says, uh, Jesus said, go into the world and preach the gospel. All right. And it says, he that believeth, and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. We know here tonight that the gospel is, um, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The gospel is just about believing in the finished work of Jesus and you have everlasting life. Now, somebody looking at that scripture might say, but it says there, uh, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But he that believeth not shall be damned. And they'll, they'll probably try and argue. Um, it says here you've got to be baptised as well. Well, you can go to the next part within that verse to sort of refute that. But I want to go to a couple more scriptures as well. It says, He that believeth and is baptised shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. So the only thing there that's damning the person is the belief. They're not believing in Jesus. He that believeth shall be saved. Uh, 1 Corinthians 1 uh, chapter 1, verse 17, uh, it's Paul speaking. And this is a, a verse that we can use to, to show a distinction between the actual gospel and baptism. 
Uh, Paul writes, Christ sent me not to baptise, but to preach the gospel. See, so you see, baptism and the gospel are two different things. Uh, Acts 16, 30 to 31, um, the, the prison guard said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Salvation, everlasting life. And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved and thy house. So we see there the gospel is just believing on the finished work of Jesus Christ. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. So the gospel is just believe and receive. All right, so I'm going to go to Jude 1, chapter 1, verse 5 to 7, guys. Just a few verses to sort of paint a bit of the context of our, the current state of our nation, Australia. Um, and I've underlined there an important part that I'm actually going to come back to later in the sermon. Uh, so in Jude, it, it, it reads, I will therefore put you in remembrance. Remembrance. Though you once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believed not. Destroyed them that believed not. Very important that I'm going to come back to. And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains, under darkness unto the judgment of the great day, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. All right, so I mentioned earlier, guys, that I've sort of come up with five important points that help me, you know, keep focused on giving the gospel to someone, and you can sort of do them on your hand. Um, so the five important points I've got here is get the testimony of the person you're preaching the gospel to. Um, I think it's very important when you're preaching it because you want to know what they believe before you start talking to them. Because if you don't get their testimony and you're talking to them and they're listening to what you're saying, they're just going to sometimes they're just going to parrot what you're saying. So what you want to do first is get what they believe. So you come back on that. Uh, the index fix, uh, sorry, the index finger here, guys. I've got the bad news. You know, we're all in need of a saviour. We all deserve to go to hell when we die. Thank God for Jesus. So we give them the bad news. Uh, the good news, you know, the gospel, which is what the, the sermon's mainly about. I'll talk a bit more about that. So the testimony, bad news, good news. Um, the ring finger, God's promise of eternal life and what, exactly what that means, what the gospel actually means. A lot of Christians will agree with you, you know, yes, Jesus died for our sins. Yes, everlasting life. But they don't know the start. They, they don't believe it in a way that the, the Bible actually teaches it. They're, they're not resting on that promise of Jesus. And the pinky baby finger is the, the calling upon the Lord element of, of our soul winning. All right. So why is it important to get their testimony? All right. So I've just got a few verses here that show why it's important to get the testimony of the person you're preaching to. Uh, Romans 10.10 10 in the KJV, the true word of God says, For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Matthew 15.18, first part of that verse says, But those things which proceed out of the mouth cometh forth from the heart. So looking at those two verses, guys, we see that with the man's heart, they believe unto righteousness and their salvation, with their mouth, the confession is made unto salvation. Um, there's this false doctrine in a lot of Christian churches today that um, they sort of say, well, you can sort of tell if someone's saved by the way they live their life. You know, they're going to church, they're keeping God's laws, they've been baptised. Um, but that's not what the Bible actually tells us. If we look at these two verses, guys, it's telling us that with the man's heart, they believe unto righteousness, but with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. You can't tell whether someone's saved by what they do, but you can get a bit of a gauge to tell whether they're saved by what they're actually saying. You see that from the mouth comes from, from the heart, and with the heart, man believeth unto righteousness. So it's very important to get their testimony. All right, going to the, the second point, uh, the bad news. Um, once you've got the testimony, usually um, when we're knocking on the door, if people you know, give us the time of day to actually talk, one thing they will say, well, look, I think I've been pretty good. I've, I've, I've been a pretty good person in my life. I haven't done anything majorly wrong. Um, 
I think I might make it to heaven. Um, but if you're listening to what they're saying, they're actually trusting in what they're doing or what they've done, aren't they? Um, and then that's where we, I guess we ask them, you know, is it okay if we go through the Bible so you can be sure that you have everlasting life, that you'll get to heaven? Um, and these are three verses. Actually, there's another one there that I want to go to um, that I usually like touching on to actually show them, well, look, the Bible's actually saying we, we haven't done good enough to get to heaven. We all deserve to die and go to hell. That's where Jesus comes in. All right, Romans 3.10 it says, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. I think later in that chapter it says, there's none that doeth good. So we can say that we've done good, uh, but doing good is righteous. The Bible's telling us there's no one righteous, no, not one. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 6.23 says, the wages of sin is death. So we're not righteous because we've all sinned. And the wages of sin is death. Um, but that's not it. That's the physical death. But then the Bible talks about a second death, a spiritual death. And it says in Revelation 21.8, um, before that verse it says, He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. Uh, you go to 1 John chapter 5, He that overcometh is simply he that believeth on Jesus, believeth he is the Son of God, believeth he is the Christ. That's how you overcometh. But then the next verse in eight chapter, uh, sorry, Revelation 21.8 says, but the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So the Bible actually tells us that all liars deserve to go to hell. Now, it didn't say anyone that told a, you know, a little lie or a major lie. It's just all liars. Anyone that's ever told a lie before. If you've ever said something that, um, you found out later was actually not true. That, that's a lie. Um, if when you were younger, I just think of myself. Um, didn't want to get in trouble off mum and dad sometimes, did you? So you might just sort of, I'll just say, stretch the truth <laughs> and lie. Um, that's a lie. The Bible says anyone that's ever told a lie deserves a second death. All right. And now... I remember going out soul with him with Brother Luke one time, and it's the first time it's ever happened to me. Sorry, going back to that. And all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. I actually come across someone that they didn't say they'd never lied before, but they just wouldn't confess that they've lied before. They just didn't say that they've lied before. Um, which was interesting because I think they, he was a Hindu, and the one next to that is all idolaters. You know, they bow down to statues as part of their religion. That's, that's on that list as well, if you don't want to confess that you're a liar. Um, but sometimes you might just get people flat out, just, I've never done anything on that list. I'm perfect, they might say. Or they won't say they're perfect, but they'll, they'll say I haven't done anything on that list. Well, we hope they don't say they're perfect. Um, but you never know. Uh, Proverbs 24.9 uh, of the KJV says, The thought of foolishness is sin. The thought of foolishness is sin. Um, if you've ever thought of something that's foolish or silly, you know, you, you, I guess you're on Facebook or YouTube and you, um, you see like a meme that's, you know, it's, you look at it, it's stupid, but it makes you laugh, all right? And then maybe later on you think of that, makes you laugh again. Well, I take that as a thought of foolishness. That's a sin in the eyes of God. That's how I see that. I don't know if anybody sees it different. We might be able to have a chat about that. Um, James 4.17. So I'm still on the point of the bad news because I, because I guess I've got a few chapters here because if we're going to preach the good news of Jesus being our saviour, um, the person we're preaching to needs to realise that they're in need of a saviour sometimes. And sometimes it's really hard to get them to understand, wait, look, I'm a sinner. I deserve to die and go to hell. Uh, the reason I'm touching on a lot of verses here is to, look, we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. Amen. James 4.17 Therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. In other words, anyone that's ever made a mistake before, more specifically, anyone that's um, failed to do something they know they should have done, that's a sin in the eyes of God, and the wages of sin is death, ultimately the second death. 1 John 3.4 Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. If you've transgressed God's law, and I guess we're pretty good at reading our Bibles, guys, we all know we have transgressed God's law. Um, that is sin. 
and the wages of sin is death, and ultimately the second death. Now you might come across someone that, that sort of says, well, I don't know God's law. Yeah, I've made mistakes before, but I don't know God's law, so how can I be guilty of sin? Leviticus 5.17 says, And if a soul sin and commit any of these things which are forbidden to be done by the commandments of the Lord, though he wist it not, though he's not aware of it, yet is he guilty and shall bear his iniquity. So what that's basically saying, if you have broken a commandment or a law of God that you were not aware of, you are still guilty of that sin and you shall bear your iniquity. It's a pretty sobering um, verse there, I think. And I just think of the, you know, the repent of your sins crowd. You know, it's coming up in a lot of, I guess, Baptist churches. I'm not sure other churches as well, but they, um, they have this, this mentality. You've got to, yes, you've got to have faith in Jesus, but you've got to repent of your sins. Or you've got to be willing to turn from your sins and then call upon him to be your saviour. Um, look, unless you know the Bible like Jesus Christ, you are not going to be able to repent of all your sins. You're not going to be able to repent of all your sins. We're all guilty if we break in God's laws and we're not aware. We shall bear our iniquity. Um, and then you might get those that will say, well, what about, what about those that were before Jesus Christ? You know, what about those that, that never got to know about Jesus Christ? Well, he only came 2,000 years ago. Well, we know from reading the Bible, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So Jesus has always been. He came in the flesh 2,000 years ago, but the Word of God has always existed. Um, you know, coming from an Aboriginal background, I get this question often. Um, my response to that is coming to this verse and a verse I'm going to go to later. It says, the wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. So all the nations that forget God as well as the wicked shall be turned into hell. See, I believe all nations had an understanding of God. They had an understanding of the Saviour of God. They may not have known his name because it had to be revealed to you know, Israel and the Jewish people before. But I believe there was some knowledge um, in all nations of God and his promised Saviour. And the reason why I say that is we come to Romans 10, uh, verse 13 to 18. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And this part here, how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Um, this, I've got the dots there because it's going on a little bit further there, guys. Uh, And how shall they preach except they be sent, as it is written? How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. But I say, have they not heard? Yes, verily, their sound went into all the earth, and their words unto the ends of of the world. Now, a few important points there, guys. Whosoever, anyone that calls upon the Lord shall be saved. Anyone that calls upon the Lord in faith shall be saved. How shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? Question that's asked. They have heard, but they have not all obeyed the gospel. Um, and it says down here, uh, but I say, have they not heard? And Paul actually says, yes, verily. So he's saying, yes, truly, they have heard about God and his Saviour. And what he does is he actually quotes a portion from Psalm 19. He says, Their sound went into all the earth, and their words unto the ends of the world. Now when you read Psalm 19, it starts off, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament sheweth his handiwork. Now if you go into Revelation, it says about the city of God, um, in the new, the new heaven and the new earth, it says, And the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. So the glory of God is lighting, lighting the city of God, but the Lamb is the light of the city. Therefore, the glory, of, the glory of God and the Lamb are one in the same, aren't they? That's how I read that. And it's saying here, or it says in the actual psalm that he's quoting, the heavens declare the glory of God. They're declaring the Son of God. They're declaring God's glory. 
Um, I don't have enough time to get into it tonight, guys. But there's a uh, there's like a there's a take there's a um, interpretation of the the zodiac. You know, we all understand the zodiac, um, Virgo, and all these sort of stuff. Well, there's twelve signs of the zodiac, right? Um, and we know that the zodiac of today is all about the person, about their self. You know, you're born under this star sign. It's got to do with you. But there's actually people out there that argue that the zodiac um, is a, a, de- a declaration, a presentation of the gospel. You know, you start off with the Virgo, the seed of the woman. Um, some say Mary, some say Sarah. And then you've got Leo, which is at the end of it, is a lion of the tribe of Judah. But each um, sign in the zodiac apparently told a story of Israel and the, and the promised Messiah. It's really interesting, guys. Uh, I, I, I get you to look it up. Uh, the Matzeroth or the Gospel in the Stars? It's a really interesting study. But, you know, the reason why I do turn to that and, and say that is because I guess in the Bible, Paul's um, argument for the fact that people have heard about Jesus and have heard the Gospel is he quotes Psalm 19. All right, so that's the bad news. All right. Number three, the gospel, the good news, what we're there to preach. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So the wages of sin is death. We all deserve death, but the Bible says, But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. It's a gift from God, paid for by the blood of Jesus Christ, and it's a gift, life that never ends. And John 3, 14 to 16 actually tells us how to receive that gift. It says, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have its eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now, if you, you read any of the Gospels, um, not sure which ones it shows up in, but we know that the Son of Man is Jesus. So these verses are saying, uh, the top verse is saying, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. John three fourteen to 16 tells us how to receive that gift and says, whosoever believeth in him, the Son of Man, Jesus, should not perish but have eternal life and have everlasting life. It's theirs, life that never ends. Life that lasts forever. More verses to, to, to drill in the good news. Romans 4, 3 to 5. So everlasting life is a gift of God. The gift of everlasting life is received through faith. Romans 4, 3 to 5 says, For what saith the scripture? Uh, any doctrine that we come up with, guys, should be able to be supported by the scripture. If not, we probably... Shouldn't worry about it. It says, For what saith the scripture, Abraham believed God, and it, what? His belief was counted unto him for righteousness. Abraham's belief is what made him righteous. More specifically, Abraham's belief in God, Jesus, was his righteousness, is his righteousness. Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Now you come across a lot of Christians, guys, that say, yeah, it's by faith, but you have to do something. You have to keep God. You can't just believe and not do anything. What does this say? But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. So it's a gift of God. The gift is received through faith, and we do nothing for it. Straight from the Bible. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace are ye saved through faith. We're saved by our faith in God's grace through Jesus. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift. There it is again, guys. The gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. All right. Now, usually you get most Christians uh, that we knock the door of. They'll be with us so far. 
Um, yes, Jesus came to die for our sins. Yes, we have everlasting life through Jesus. But they don't know the extent of that promise. Okay? And sometimes it takes a bit of explaining to do. All right, so the fourth part, so the ring finger, the promise, God's promise, defining his promise. Uh, we know it as eternal security, once saved, always saved. Amen. John 3, 36. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. So that was John the Baptist saying that, I believe. Um, but then in John 6, 47, it's actually Jesus speaking. He says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. By the mouth of two or three witnesses, the Bible says, doesn't it? All right. So it's saying here, he that believeth on the Son, we know the Son of God is Jesus Christ, hath, that's the old English word for has, everlasting life. So the moment you believe, the Bible says you have everlasting life. You has, that person has everlasting life. Everlasting, as we know, is means last forever. So the Bible is saying, once you believe, you have life that lasts forever. Amen? Once you believe, you have life that lasts forever. So then, uh, this is the part of the presentation of the gospel that I'd like to say that, but then I'll give an extreme example. You, you want to give an extreme example because sometimes it's just, yeah, yeah, nod your head. I, I, I agree with you. Um, you give an extreme example to see if they actually uh, understand what this verse is actually saying. Uh, so one thing I like to do is I say, all right, so let's say this person believes on Jesus here. The uh, Bible says they have everlasting life, yeah? They have life that lasts forever. And the person will go, oh, yeah, okay. All right, so let's just say five, down, five years down the track, um, this person doesn't read their Bible, they don't go to church, they don't keep God's laws, they try to ignore God in their life. They fall into a life of sin, they kill somebody and kill themselves. I ask them, will this person go to heaven or hell? Um, and they'll say, well, I guess he'll go to hell, wouldn't he? And I said, okay. Remember it said it lasts forever? It's life that lasts forever. Uh, hell is death. Uh, that's death. That's not life. Um, so if God gives you everlasting life here and five years, later, five years later down the track, can he take it away from you? And sometimes I'll say, well, of course he can. He's God. And then I'll ask, well, then did it last forever? And I'll say, no. So then can God take it away? Yeah. Well, then did it last forever? No. And you just get them going in that cycle until they go, wait a second. If it lasts forever... You can't take it away because two reasons that sort of interlinked. One, um, if he takes it away after five years, that never lasted forever. It only lasted for five years, didn't it? And two, uh, that would make God a liar because God says you have everlasting life once you believe, doesn't he? But Titus 1.2 says, in hope of eternal life, so we're still talking about the gospel, salvation by grace through faith, which God, that Cannot lie. Promised before the world began. Hebrews 6.18 says it's impossible for God to lie. So by God's own word, once you've believed, he can't take it away. And I think most of us already know that. <laughs> and then we come to the fifth point I like to keep, to keep me focused and track uh, on track. Um, the calling upon the Lord. Romans 10, 8 to 13 of the King James Bible says, But what saith the scripture? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. Remember, with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Thou shalt, thou will be saved. For with the heart men believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Confession is made unto salvation. For what saith the scripture? Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Uh, for the scripture saith, sorry. Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. No difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, shall be saved. Uh, next verse there, guys, is Psalm 116, 
uh, verse 13 says, I will take the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. Now, some people might say to you, um, but didn't you say it was just by belief? Now you're telling me I've got to say a prayer? We might get that question, guys. Um, here's how I reconcile that with my mind. So, everlasting life is like an unto as a gift, isn't it? All right? I guess, you know, Christmas not too long ago, we get presents, presents, gifts, synonymous. Okay? Here's how I reconcile it. So, once you believe you receive that gift, you receive the present, um, and the calling upon the Lord is like opening it up. Now, whether you open it up or not, is that going to change the fact whether you still have the gift sitting on your shelf? still yours. Um, but I guess calling upon the Lord, I guess with, with me, I would say it's, it's more for the believer. I guess when you call upon the Lord, you can sort of gauge when you were saved. Um, but I guess the Bible does tell us to do it, so, so be it. But that's how I, I sort of see it, guys. The gift is yours. Whether you want to open it up or not, it's up to you. Um, I will take the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. The cup of salvation is yours once you believe. All right. Sorry, guys. Now, most of you are probably sitting there saying, Anthony, you're preaching to the choir, brother. We know all this. You know, and I hope you got something out of it uh, from the verses that I referred to. But here's why I wanted to go back over it again. Like I said, it's a new year, guys. I would like it if we would consider, at the very least, making soul winning a priority. You know what I mean? It's a commandment of God. I would say it's the most important commandment of God because what did Jesus say? He said, um, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy mind, and with all thy soul, and with all thy strength. And the second is like it, love thy neighbour as thyself. For all the law and the prophets hang upon these two commandments. You preaching the gospel covers all that. One, you're obeying God, aren't you? He said preach the gospel. Two, you're loving your neighbour as yourself. Because you don't know whether that your neighbour is going to heaven or hell. But if you preach them the gospel... They receive that, believe, call upon the Lord to be their saviour. Um, there's nothing more ultimate than that kind of love, I believe. It's everlasting life. It's life that lasts forever in the new heaven and new earth with Jesus Christ. All right, so why should we preach the gospel? Like I just said, guys, it's a commandment of God. Mark 16, 15 to 16. Um, second point there is, you know, we get better at doing it. And you might say, come on. I know I'm going to heaven. I don't want to get better at doing it. Well, I just said there, guys, you know, if you, um, you preach the gospel, you get other people saved, you're loving your neighbour as yourself. Um, but there's a really sober uh, verse, a few verses in Ezekiel that I just want to read from. I don't have it up here on the, on the slides, but I do have it in my notes. And it says here, Those the, though these three men, Noah, Daniel and Job, were in it, they should deliver but their own souls by their own righteousness, saith the Lord. So it's saying there, you know, we know about Noah, Daniel, Job. Um, it's saying they can only deliver themselves by their own righteousness. And what is our righteousness? We covered it. Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. So our righteousness is believing in God. Our righteousness is not keeping God's laws. Our righteousness is not getting baptised. Our righteousness is not calling upon the Lord. Well, I guess you call upon the Lord for the righteousness through Jesus Christ, but anything you do is not your righteousness. There's none righteous, no, not one, for all of sin that come short of the glory of God. Our righteousness is our faith in Jesus Christ. What Ezekiel 14, 14 is saying that, I guess, in the end times, when God judges everyone, Noah, Daniel and Job aren't going to deliver anyone but themselves because they've believed on the Lord. It doesn't say that Noah's going to deliver his children or his friends or his family. Why do we want to get better at doing it, guys? So we can actually give the gospel to our friends, to our family. Ask you a question, have all your friends believed on the Lord to be their saviour? 
If they haven't, they go on to hell. We know that hell lasts forever. What about your family? What about your brothers, sisters, cousins, uncles, aunties, parents, spouse, children? Give the gospel to your children as soon as you can, guys. It's well to try and get to them. So we should go and preach the gospel so we get better at doing that, so we can get our loved ones saved by the word of God. Point three, it benefits our nation, it benefits Australia. Uh, I read a verse out earlier, guys, which sort of hinted at, you know, the, um, uh, the vote that occurred last year, which was pretty disappointing, um, where they legalised something that is actually declared a sin by God. Um, reason why I say we should preach the gospel is because it benefits our nation, it benefits Australia. Now, I just want to go back to Genesis 18 to illustrate my point. Um, we all know about Sodom and Gomorrah and the sins that they were committing in that time. And before God actually overturns and destroys Sodom and Gomorrah, he has a back and forth with, with Abraham, doesn't he? Um, so we know from the scriptures that initially God wanted to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah for the wickedness and for what you know the people crying out, all the wickedness that was going on. But then ultimately we have a look at the discussion between Abraham and, and God. And there was actually something else that was holding back God's, uh, you know, God was merciful and there was something else that could have held back God's wrath. So I'll just read a bit of it here for you guys, 18, uh, 22 to, to verse 33. All right, it says, And the men turned their faces from thence and went towards Sodom. But Abraham stood yet before the Lord. And Abraham drew near and said, Wilt thou also destroy the righteous, the righteous, there it is again, guys, the righteous with the wicked? Peradventure there be fifty righteous within the city, wilt thou also destroy and not spare the place for the fifty righteous that are therein? So Abraham's pleading with God, you know, God, will you, will you destroy the righteous with the wicked? God says to him, I'm oh, sorry, Abraham's still, still talking here, that be far from thee to do after this manner, to slay the righteous with the wicked, and that the righteous should be as the wicked. That be far from thee, shall not the judge of all the earth do right? And the Lord said, If I find in Sodom 50 righteous within the city, then I will spare all the place for their sakes. God is saying, If I find 50 righteous, he will spare the city. We've just been going over, guys. What makes someone righteous? Think about it. It goes all the way down. So, you know, he's got back and forth. He, you know, uh, what if there's five less than 50? He goes all the way down till he gets to 10. All right, so I'll just read that out for us, guys. And he said, Oh, let not the Lord be angry. So Abraham's going, Look, I'm probably pushing my luck here. <laughs> I've already asked him about three or four times. I wonder how he's going to react. And he said, Oh, let not the Lord be angry. And I will speak yet but this once. Peradventure, 10 shall be found there. 10 righteous shall be found there. And he said, I will, I will not destroy it for ten sake. I will not destroy it for ten sake. What the Bible is saying there is that God was willing to not destroy Sodom and Gomorrah for the sake of ten righteous people. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. So God was not going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah if he found ten saved souls. He was not going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah if he found ten saved souls. And who was dwelling in Sodom and Gomorrah? Lot. You know him as righteous Lot. Why? Because he believed in the Lord. Now, if you count up Lot's family, you've got Lot, his wife, his two children, uh, his, two, his two daughters, are uh, the ones that knew not men. Now, if you read it, you also get an indication that he had at least two more other daughters that were married. Remember, he goes to the families, he tries to plead with them. Um, you know, God's going to destroy the city, get out. And they laughed, they laughed him to scorn. So that was um, the families of his other daughters, all right? Because remember, the two that were with him knew not men, so there had to be at least two other daughters. All right, so you've got Lot and his uh, wife, the two daughters that knew not men, and at least two daughters that were married, which I would say were saved. You've got six people there. 
God said he was going to spare Sodom and Gomorrah for the, for, the, for the sake of ten righteous. Now, if each one of those got someone saved, you do the math. That's 12 people. So the Bible's saying he would not have destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah if 12 people were saved. And all they had to do was win one soul to the Lord each. One soul. So I'll set a challenge for you guys this year. And it's not easy. I went out soul winning today. No souls were saved. Barely had discussions. But I'd, I'd, I'd hope that all of us here, here tonight, guys, would, would um, set the New Year's resolution of trying to save at least one soul. One soul, who knows? Um, God might hold off on the, on the wrath and the tribulation in our lifetime and, our life, and, the, and the, the lifetime of our kids. Benefits our nation if we preach the gospel. All right, to finish up, guys, uh, thank you for your patience. I just want to finish up on, on one last slide, and it sort of ties in with my vision for Australia. Um, in the new heaven and the new earth, Revelation 21, uh, verse 22 to 24 of the KJV, the true word of God, says, And I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. There it is there, guys, that verse I was referring to earlier. Um, I always have a bit of a giggle when I... Uh, read this verse because, you know, sometimes when we're driving in the car, Emma to be sitting in the back and she'll be like, oh, get away, son. And I say, don't worry, darling, there'll be no sun in heaven. In the new heaven and the new earth, there's no need for the sun. Jesus is going to light it up for us. And it says, and the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it, and the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honour into it. And the nations of them which are saved. Guys, I want to ask each one of you a question. TCIP. Do you want Australia to be one of the saved na- uh, Do you want Australia to be one of the nations of them which are saved? Do you want Australia to be one of the nations of them which are saved? Answer. Preach the gospel. Thank you for listening, guys. Let's uh, finish in a word of prayer. Uh, Heavenly Father, I, I pray that. Um, the sermon, uh, you know, struck a chord with the brothers and sisters, and um, you know, they learned something uh, from from my preaching of your word. Thank you, Father, for for guiding me through it, and I I just pray that we would um, have it on our hearts to try and save at least one soul each um, this year, Lord. New year, plenty of days to do it. Um, and I just pray that we would encourage each other in doing that, and I thank you for everything, Lord. Thank you for guiding myself, also for guiding the brothers and sisters here to the truth that salvation is by faith and faith alone. I just pray that you would give us the courage and strength to preach that to our loved ones. And I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, that was a good, uh, good reminder of, uh, I guess, the purpose of our church. And, uh, you know, the reason why we're here, to preach the gospel, to make, you know, make, uh, to, you know, to teach people, make disciples, right? And the reason why we're making disciples is so we can get more people saved. So that's, that's what this church is all about. So that's a good reminder. And, you know, if you're wondering how to get better at soul winning, I mean, really, you just have to memorize the, the plan of salvation. So if you can memorize pretty much what Anthony, Anthony's gone through today, just the different points in the plan of salvation, that's the first step. And the second step is just to get out there and participate. You know, like a, a lot of you maybe are not that good at preaching the gospel, aren't that confident, just because you haven't really been doing it that much. But then if you go out and preach the gospel, you, you go as a silent partner and listen, you, you hear it again and again, you become so familiar with it that you can then explain that to somebody else. That, that's all it is. It's the same with anything you do. You know, you start a new job and you're like, oh, what do I do? But then all of a sudden it just becomes familiar because you've done it so many times. You're familiar with it, so then you become an expert at it. It's not that you are anything special or anything. And and for those of us who have been going soul winning for a while, you know that going preaching the gospel is not a complex thing. It's it's really just the amount of effort and time you put in. You know, it's it's just about getting out there because the actual task at hand is very simple. 
So if you're newer to soul winning, you know, and you're you know scared of going soul winning, you don't don't you know there's nothing to be scared of. I mean, I know, you know, it's it's like you know I was talking last week about insects, right? You know, we're scared of insects. They're probably more scared of us than we are of them, and yet we fear it anyway. But really, when you go out soul winning, there's there's really nothing to be scared of as a new person because I'm not going to send you out there by yourself if you've never gone soul winning before. Do you know what I mean? So if you've, if you've never gone soul winning before and you're, you're not very experienced, obviously you'll only go if there's somebody that's experienced that can take you as a silent partner. And then all you're doing is just observing. You know, you just observe, you listen, you pray for the person speaking, you pray for the person at the door, you know, that they would listen and that they'd be attentive. And you learn. You, you learn the things that are said, the questions that are asked, and the more familiar you become with it, then, then the more knowledgeable you become. So soul winning is really, it's a really simple thing. It's just, it's not easy because it's a spiritual thing to do and our flesh doesn't want to do things that are, are spiritual. If you think about the Christian life, the Christian life is it's very, it's very simple, isn't it? It's not complex. You know, you've got church, you've got fellowship, you've got reading your Bible, you've got prayer, you've got soul winning. It's, it's not really that complex. But because it requires walking in the Spirit, that's why it's difficult, because our flesh doesn't want to do those things, and it's that battle with the flesh that makes it difficult, but the task itself is not that complex. So thanks, Anthony. That's a good reminder for you know, what, what we're here to do.